Okay, um, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Young Ki Kim. I'm professor of physics at the University of Chicago and president of the Korean American Scientists and Engineers Association, KCA. I'm truly excited and thrilled that uh, with us this evening, we have Jun Ha, professor of mathematics at Princeton University and the 2022 Fields Medalist. I'm sure that all of you know the Fields Medal is the, the highest honor in mathematics. So please join me in congratulating and welcoming Professor Ha with a big round of applause. But of course, Professor Ha, you don't hear it because of all the other people are muted. So imagine that there's a big round of applause. Uh, so we are uh, very much uh, look forward to listening to your trajectory and achievement through this uh, conversation. But before uh, we start that, I would like to uh, make a very brief introduction of, uh, of uh, Professor Ha. Uh, he was born in California, grew up in South Korea. He majored in physics, astronomy, and mathematics in college and got a master's degree in mathematics all at Seoul National University. He came back to US in 2009, began uh, his PhD studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and completed his uh, doctorate at the University of Michigan in 2014. Between 2014 and 2020, he held research fellowships and visiting professorships at Clay Mathematics Institute, Institute for Advanced Study, and Princeton University, and, and was a, a professor at Stanford University between 2020 and 21. He moved to Princeton University as a professor in 2021. Prior to the 2022 Fields Medal, Professor Ha received the numerous honors and awards, including the 2019 New Horizons Prize for Early Career Achievement in Mathematics, the Blavatnik Award for Young Scientists in 2017, and the Samsung Hoan Prize in Science, Physics and Mathematics section in 2021. Like many of you, I read a number of articles about him. Uh, I'd like to share a few uh, sentences from these articles describing him. Quote, he dropped out, of, dropped out high school to become a poet. He was not interested in mathematics until his sixth year in college. Studying in graduate school, he has solved several major math problems. His profound insights connecting combinatorics and geometry have led to the highest honor in math. He himself draws the parallels between the, the artist and the mathematician. So now uh, concerning our conversation, I would like to first uh, thank uh, almost uh, 60 people who have submitted uh, questions. Uh, special thanks have to go to our high school students and undergraduate graduate students who submitted the questions. And I'll go over some of them, not all, unfortunately. And toward the end, I hope I will have some time to get questions from you. Um, uh, I, I will hope that you can use the Zoom uh, chat box that be writing your questions and I'll, I'll go through and ask questions at the end. So Professor Her, first, first uh, question, uh, what well, set of questions concerned your research about the work that you got the Fields Medal for, how, did you, how would you describe it to uh, this general audience, including junior, high school and high school students? Um, well, there are largely two different types of mathematics that you encounter in, on all levels. One is the study of discrete objects, usually things that you can count, one, two, three, and finite sets and relations between finite sets, maybe a network of some kind, so graph connectivity, that kind of thing. 
And the other thing is what you would call a continuous mathematics, the study of quantities that vary smoothly or continuously, say, and things that change as time flows, maybe. And most of mathematics disciplines fall into either one of these types of mathematics and and our intuition for them have evolved rather separately throughout the long history of mathematics and the kind of math that i and my collaborators friends do these days is to try to build bridges between these two different realms of mathematics the discrete mathematics and continuous mathematics. So on some level, it is completely believable that the, the fact that we have these two different types of mathematics is an accident, like a, a biological accident. Our species have evolved in such and such environment and our sense organs have evolved in such a way that we perceive things on certain levels that's clearly like a continuous or smooth. And there is some other level that makes it useful for us to have this discrete type of mathematics. But if we have evolved in a completely different scale or completely different environment, we would certainly have different type of mathematics. And, but some of the questions that you can ask in mathematics, um, it's clear that they are independent of the circumstances that we have evolved in as a species. So it's definitely very, very useful thing to have uh, the, the kind have the intuition that allows you to go back and forth between these two different modes of mathematical reasoning. And of course, we have our limitations, but we can do something about this uh, artificial division of mathematical insights and well that's what I and people like myself try to do like build bridges connecting discrete and continuous mathematical insights great well so uh, then maybe you can tell us how you uh, choose your math problems and and how you tackle them um, well, I have a very practical criterion for that. Um, I try to work on the problems that I can make progress on. That's the, that's the most important thing. And, and this is not an obvious criterion. Some other mathematicians operate in a completely different way. And many of us, as you can imagine, are idealists and just uh, some of us are just drawn to certain problems that they feel are the most important or profound or beautiful. But uh, well, I am I am a, a practicalist, and I I personally hate difficult problems. So I try to find a problem that is easy to me personally. <laughs> right. um, yeah. But here, yeah, it's also, um, you know, you kind of mentioned a little bit, but maybe I, I, I just want to say a few words based on what I learned about you. Uh, you said that, uh, you know, you take a daily long walk around Princeton University and you are very good at uh, finding small livings while you are making your way through the woods. So uh, I wonder, you know, if uh, nature has been inspiring you finding uh, your own problems to solve? Well, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I'm just good at finding stuff. Um, I, I don't know nature is inspiring my like, mathematical ideas in any direct way, mm -hmm. but I, I would empirically speaking, I would say it's a very helpful habit to expose yourself to nature. Um, yeah, I mean, oftentimes in mathematics, and I suppose the same for other fields that needs to solve problems, uh, but especially in mathematics, you get stuck very, very often. And somehow you have to have 
that algorithm to unstuck yourself. Mm -hmm. One thing about being stuck is that if you're stuck and if you are in the same environment that made you stuck, then you remain stuck. That's typically what happens. So it's important to make yourself open up. Uh, so how do you do that? Yeah, just uh, go outside, walk in the woods, and uh -huh. go in the wide open area and mm -hmm. just expose yourself to a lot of different things. Uh, it's a lot of space. You need a lot of space, just mm -hmm. mentally and also like uh, mm -hmm. physically. I really resonate with what you just said. I think uh, it happens to many of us when you get stuck. It's not only mathematical problems, but other scientific problems or any problems in your life. Uh, you just uh, either take a walk or stay away from what you're really uh, in your environment uh, yeah. that you have been focusing for many hours, get away and approach your problem from very different angles. I think that probably certainly help um, yeah yeah i i very much agree great uh now of course many people are interested in your uh background as uh, because you want to, to become a poet uh i wonder whether your poetic detour has been any importance uh, to your mathematical career and that was a very long time ago i can barely remember what uh -huh. myself was like back then and in general like uh, I think you should never believe the answers that you get when you ask questions of that kind to someone like we all live once and exactly once and we never treaded that path that we didn't go through so I have like absolutely no understanding of what I would have been like if I was not interested in poetry, would have my mathematics affected in any way. I mean, people always like develop some version of story that they tell themselves. And oftentimes when asked, tell other people as well. But these are just stories. And honestly, I have just no idea whether it has anything to do with the kind of mathematics that I do now. But yeah. Humans are very complex. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah it's complicated. It's, it's very right, complicated. It's, uh, it's yeah. hard to uh, yeah. understand ourselves. I totally agree with you. Yeah. So uh, another question, actually, is, is something that I was uh, uh, in, very interested in asking. Uh, some say that or the, the mathematicians are looking for beauty, like what artists do. And you yourself said uh, during one of uh, the interviews, that you are grabbing something that is already there rather than creating something <coughs> in your mind. So uh, I feel the mathematicians search for both uh, beauty and truth. Beauty is the truth, the truth, beauty. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know by John Keats. So what do you think of uh, any connection between beauty and truth in your work? So when I was doing that interview, uh, <laughs> probably really wanted to impress this other person. So by <laughs> saying something like uh, that sound profound and maybe like that. But uh, I mean, in truth, like uh, I'm a completely like a shallow type of guy. And, and, and to say it in a slightly better way, I, I am a, I'm a very practical person. And if you want to make a good career, say, in one of the pure disciplines, say, mathematics, truth and beauty, those are like uh, absolutely necessary things. It's not, it has, it doesn't have anything to do with like a romantic view of your something. Like a truth, that's uh, certainly a necessary thing. If you publish a paper that's just not true, then you're out of the game. Right. <laughs> I mean, you can be forgiven maybe twice or three times, but if you consistently do that, that's just no brainer. And the uh, beauty that's also absolutely necessary, it has nothing to do with your romantic view or worldview. I mean, if, 
if what you do is not beautiful, it will not excite people, especially your colleagues, and most importantly, yourself. Um, and if you do not find what you're looking at or what you're working on beautiful, then you will get bored. And that's, that's fatal. Like, that's the, the one thing that you want to keep in yourself as a researcher is that pure excitement and joy when you are doing your thing. And so in that sense, this uh, truth and beauty both are absolutely necessary thing to just uh, keep, make a living, uh, to make a good job out of. That's right. Of course, the beauty can be very different for different fields and different people. But if you think it's a beauty, that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. OK, now moving to slightly different uh, set of questions. Uh, this is about you know, students and their lives. Uh, so a number of people were surprised to learn that you had no desire to be a mathematician when you were younger and asked how and why you chose math. And what makes math special to you? I mean, isn't that a very, very natural thing? 99.999% of people have absolutely no desire to be a mathematician because there are so many cool things in the world besides mathematics. I mean, mathematics, that's, that's good. It's good, but uh, it's not that exciting in any obvious, obvious way, especially when you're young. And there are so many fun things in the world, especially when you're young. So, yeah. How did you discover what you wanted to um, do? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I like mathematics, it's, but uh, that, it's just that I, I find so many different things very interesting when I was young. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow my path, uh, at least the uh, version of story that I tell myself uh, how I got to be a mathematician is like a almost completely accident so um, I was really into writing like uh, physics astronomy like uh, stars very far away like a structure of the universe and time and these are like obviously fascinating things and I really wanted to pursue them um, and I did, uh, that, that was the major I chose when I entered university. But then I, I had uh, suffered from uh, an episode of depression and I just completely flunked out of all the courses that I was taking in my junior year. And then, well, I, too, I had to take a rest uh, for some reason. I don't know why that happened. It's, I'm just like that. Um, but when I returned to school, um, while I still loved the subjects that I was studying before, but I just, uh, as a fresh start, I wanted to do something else. Um, it, that just felt like a natural thing to do uh, at the moment as a sign of new beginning, maybe. And then the mathematics was just there. It was a very, it was an adjacent field, not very far from the things that I were doing, but at the same time, it was a new thing for me. And so, and there are some very attractive courses that I could fit in my timetable. So I did so and I liked it, so. Great. Um... I think you touched a little bit, but there are a number of questions from our undergraduate graduate students. Um, some uh, students struggle. I think it's it's totally okay. <laughs> Many of us uh, did the same thing. Uh, some uh, struggling not because they don't understand the meaning of studying college. There are some questions about that, and some experiencing uh, moments of a feeling lost. And so you touched a little bit. Some have uh, anxiety and difficulties in their research life or personal life. So I think you already shared a little bit of your experiences. Um, do you have any uh, advice or maybe your own experience that how, how you overcome 
these difficulties as a student? Um, I don't know. I mean, I have a, I want, I want to make a very general comment. So, which is that, um, I'm not, I'm not a very knowledgeable person and I, I don't have any kind of a special wisdom that other people do not have. I did not have before and I, I don't have it right now. I mean, young people uh, tend to, I, I, I was uh, that kind of person as well, but the young people especially have the tendency to believe that if somebody is like an Ivy League professor, maybe it's decorated with medals and prizes, then maybe he has a special kind of wisdom inside him. And I, I, I can assure you that in most cases, there are exceptions, but in a lot of those cases, is that is just not the case. Uh, and winning the Bills medal didn't make me any like wise, more wise, uh, not even a single bit. So you shouldn't like uh, <laughs> take too much weight, uh, put too much weight on what I say, but I can only say out of my experience. And uh, one thing that you can be pretty sure is that everybody struggles maybe in a different way, mm -hmm. but if you feel that you're struggling, then that's completely normal. Uh, right. I think in some sense, it's struggling is the, the uh, healthy. If you don't struggle at all, <laughs> I'll be more worried <laughs> about people, students who don't struggle. I mean, I, it's, you know, probably I, I, I said it so too strongly, but, in different level and some people struggle more and, and others and, and different uh, issues. But a bit of struggling uh, or a lot of struggling, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing in some way. So I, I, I agree, but I, I also I should acknowledge that some types of struggle is, is very, can be very, very dark. Absolutely, yeah, that's right, that's right. Absolutely. I don't want to, yeah. Right, right. We should and, there, and sometimes there's just uh, no easy solution. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, yeah, oftentimes there is a way out, often mm -hmm. unexpected way, unexpected to you. Somehow you have to find yourself to like uh, go slightly beyond yourself. Usually the struggle happens when you have a very solid boundary of yourself, like this is who I am or who I should be. And, and that usually does not help. Well, thank you for the wisdom uh, from your own experience. Yeah. Uh, now, a little bit more touching on your research and, and specific uh, tips, or uh, again, you're just uh, speaking about your experiences. Here are some questions. Were you always passionate about mathematics or was there a point you thought you could be pursuing other fields? I guess this is after maybe your PhD time. And what aspects of your research fields interest and inspire, inspire you and, and why? Well, I guess uh, I already answered the first question, which right. is that I, I wasn't always interested in mathematics. So I, I started rather late, but fortunately for me, like uh, uh, once I started in mathematics, I, uh, everything like a uh, flow very naturally, and I didn't have a second thought about mm -hmm. doing other stuffs. Well, I I didn't have time to waste. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I, th I think this question is after you uh, decide to be a mathematician, but its answer is that you're yeah. always uh, excited about uh, your work and, and continued. And, and similarly, I think these are especially students who are doing research. I think they are curious to know whether your strategy has been go deeper and deeper, uh, no matter how long it will take, or do you put aside and bring it up later? You have to make time. So that's, uh, again, the ways of doing your, your research. 
I I would say, uh, first of all, I, I don't think I really have a strategy, at least consciously. Um, I, I just hate being strategic, but sometimes I am like that. But in general, I don't know. I, I think just uh, in general, like uh, this uh, intention and willpower, these sort of uh, things are are highly overrated because these are all coming from like a very tiny version of yourself and so oftentimes you're much more capable than that and to make the bigger version of yourself more active you shouldn't confine yourself by goals and so on and i i i i, I think i'm closer to the second version of the, uh, the second type that was in the description, mm -hmm. uh, especially I don't like uh, I don't like uh, I don't like the expressions like uh, no matter what it takes, like uh, go deeper and deeper, whatever, and no matter what it takes. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I just don't like that, and that's like an obsession. It makes mm -hmm. you, it mm -hmm. makes you very very small. And you're it it make it gives you a tunnel vision, mm -hmm. and it's very very easy to fail in that mode of operation because you are eliminating a lot of different possibilities for yourself. And in general, that that gives you trouble, mm -hmm. unless you're very very lucky. Okay, the next questions about um, your own research area and, and related. Uh, and the questions uh, are, for example, how do you balance between learning new stuff and working on your own research? Would uh, an interdisciplinary background be helpful in your research? Do you have any tips on how to combine different fields of study to solve the problems? So, any of these questions you'd like to answer, uh, that'd be great. Um, the first one, I, I'm, I'm pretty heavily leaning on the doing research side. Uh, believe it or not, I'm pretty terrible at learning things. Um, and for example, like from classes or stuff or participating in a seminar or somehow i mean it works great for some some people it's somehow i never managed to learn anything in that mode i only learn new things when i'm trying to do stuff and do in this context i mean like research so when I try to do something and I, when I need something and I try to think about it, and that's how I learn new things. Um, but different things work for different people. So it's, it's a really a question of style and taste. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next questions are about work and life balance. <laughs> How do you balance between your research and your mental and physical well being? Uh, what is your stress reliever? Um, well, I mean, the, the framing of the question make it sound like that you have to balance two things, right? Maybe in order to keep your mental and physical well-being, you have to maybe sacrifice a little bit of research and vice versa. But I, I think it's it's completely not like that. So in order to like uh, excel in your research, you really have to take care of yourself. And the, the way to excel in research is to take a good care of yourself mentally and physically. So it's it's not like a this or that. Like mm -hmm. in order to, and and if you are like a researcher, like a research mathematician, if that that is who you are and that is what you are supposed to do, and 
your like a mental well-being is also heavily dependent on how well your research goes. So it goes in both ways. So it's, it's not really about balancing. It's all, it's all part of one package that you have to take care of. That's great. Yeah, that's great uh, advice. Okay, now I'll just change a little bit topic. Uh, this uh, is about- Oh, by the way, you should what? really ask one question at a time because I have a terrible, <laughs> like a short time memory. So okay. once I give answer to the first question, I have like a completely forgotten about the second and the third question, so. Got it, got it, so I won't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this is a question about, um, you know, uh, education uh, as, as a kid or teenager. Uh, we heard that uh, when you are a kid and teenager, you hated the constraints and could not focus in a classroom setting. However, you preferred to do on your own work, the, uh, to do on, on your own. Actually, this is a question about your parents, actually. Uh, we, we understand that your father teaching uh, or taught statistics and mother Russian language and literature. And what did your parents do? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I was pretty much free range, I, I think. Uh, and and I, I, I liked it. Uh, yeah, they, they were like, a, in general, like a very good friends of mine. Uh, mm -hmm. And they would talk to me a lot, but uh, they didn't have like any very rigid expectations for me. And in, in some sense, they, they didn't care like a, too much about like a, my academic progress. Um, I mean, once uh, one year I was uh, preparing for a college entrance exam and then I was out, uh, went to this one of these havans and then I went back in the evening and I just noticed that all my stuffs, all my like uh, books and textbooks and so on, they were gone. Like uh, my mother just uh, happened to decide that uh, she's the, uh, doing the interior remodeling of our apartment and they just, forgot to tell me about it. And she just sent all my textbooks to some warehouse without telling me. And this was like a, like a four months before the exam. And then like, what happened to my books? And then, oh, I, I thought you don't, you didn't need them. So, but anyway, we sent them to warehouse and we were going to do this interior work and we we're going to live in your grandma's house for one month from now on. And, and somehow and this sort of a, like a lack of interest and sort of a, uh, things uh, was very relieving because it mm -hmm. gives you the impression that <laughs> no, it's this, uh, this uh, exam kind of things. It's not a big deal. I mean, wh when you're very young, this looks like a huge thing, like uh, your entire life is dependent on it and you get, and in a sense that's true maybe, but just feeling that pressure as a, young kid is, is not good. And if there's a, someone in your life that takes things more lightheartedly, then that's, uh, I think that was pretty relieving to me. Yeah. I don't think uh, my parents behaved that way in uh, like a strategically mm -hmm. <laughs> to have this effect, but, uh, <laughs> but I like that. Maybe yeah. they, they believe in you in some way. Maybe they did, yeah, I know. But whether they had a good reason to believe, uh, I'm not sure about that, yeah. Now that you are parent of two children, um, how do you educate your children? So again, the same, <laughs> same. kind of a uh, very general uh, necessary remark. So I'm a, like a completely begin complete beginner as far as parenting goes. And I have a, no clue on like how to be a good parent. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I would like to know the answer to that question. Um, but yeah, again, I, I try to be a good person, especially when I'm hanging around uh, 
with my kids. Um, mm -hmm. I try to be their good friends. Um, I, I like them and I try to show it. I think these are like a few general principles that cannot be not correct. So, <laughs> but other than that, I have no specific ideas mm -hmm. how to be a good parent. It's uh, generally clueless. Being good friends is very, very important, I, I think. Uh, um, about, uh, this is a question from uh, undergraduate students. Uh, they would like to know your teaching philosophy and methodology for undergraduate students. I'm also a beginning teacher, so <laughs> I'm not a, like experienced like a professor. So I had a, this uh, clay fellowship thing, which exempted me from teaching for many, many years. And this is like my second or third year as a professor with actual teaching duties. So I don't know, but I think uh, it's, useful for yourself and your students that you actually enjoy teaching, you enjoy spending time with your students. I think that always has a positive effect. And I think uh, as teachers, we have some control, not absolute control, but uh, some control uh, of that. So I, I try to prepare myself uh, so that I can enjoy the time I spend with my students in the classroom. Um, the, for graduate students, is there anything uh, that uh, they should remember as a graduate student? Something important thing for them to remember? Um, I think uh, if you uh, if you're if you're a grad student, I think it's just a good time to learn how to be independent as a thinker. Mm -hmm. um, I know this is often said as it's easier said than done, but it's, it's perhaps more important than people think on the surface. Um, so try to be independent from your advisor. So mm -hmm. he, he could be your mentor, but uh, he, he probably it's better not to get like a step-by-step -step instructions from him or her mm -hmm. and try to find your way, find, try to figure out how to operate your brain and figure out things. Yeah. Right. So uh, there will be, you know, for some students, it's a challenging from high school or college education, which is a less yeah. independent thinker. And now you have to have some phase transition. But I think everybody, you can start with a small uh, independent yeah. uh, project and thinking and it can grow. So I think that's, uh, I agree with you. It's, it's very uh, important. Um, any books that you would like to recommend to our high school students or college students? Um, well, I don't know. There are so many good books out there. Uh, I have nothing like a specifically related to mathematics or something, but I, I, I read uh, this uh, book by David White. He's a poet, Irish poet. Uh, he has uh, so many books. But, uh, one, one thing that's a little bit unusual is uh, his book titled Consolations, The Underlying Meaning of Everyday Words. So he lists like a 50 something everyday words like love or arrival or friendship or stuff like that. And then he tries to tell the true meaning of those mundane words. And it, it's written beautifully. And uh, it's pretty clear that okay, he's a very talented writer. And what the, the thing that I like about um, his style of writing is that, first of all, it goes very deep, very quickly, but at the same time, it's pretty clear, at least to my eyes, that he didn't revise his writing too much. So it almost feels as if 
you are doing some sort of a live interaction with him. Mm -hmm. So for example, unlike most poets sentences, his expressions are highly repetitive. He has uh, some of his like favorite expressions and the uh, favorite way of saying things. And he didn't try to conceal those. Um, so uh, maybe I've been in terms of like structural elegance, maybe this is a minus, but it really gives you the impression of spontaneity and the genuineness of his expressions. Great. Um, now moving to a different topic. Uh, this is a connecting or relation between you and your field and, and your work and uh, rather different fields. Um, that is, it, it, can your work be uh, connected and applied to uh, other fields such as computer science and technology or uh, perhaps with the economics? I don't want to add to this uh, stereotype, pure mathematician, but uh, in full honesty, like, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I don't care. <laughs> um, but uh, there are some papers like uh, using some of my works with my collaborators to do something in computer science, but uh, like a theoretical computer science to be precise, but uh, you can use some of the results to show that certain quantities can be computed like a faster than what was expected by an obvious algorithm. So there are, there are connections like this and maybe in the distant future, we will see more, but I don't know. Yeah, you never know, especially, you know, math or basic science, uh, the immediate applications uh, or sometimes application or so the benefit, societal benefit takes uh, decades or even a century. So <laughs> you never know. Uh, I mean, but this is like, uh, this is, I think, exactly the same kind of thing that I talked about before about the... Uh, role of like a willpower and intention being overrated but that was a the, the, that discussion was completely on the individual level but this is the same thing i think basically the same thing on a much much more global level us as a species this uh like uh i want to do this thing because i want to make something useful or this is like a yeah, intention and willpower at the level of society or species. And this is just in general limits yourself or ourselves in a very severe way on how we operate, how we think or what we can think. And I, I first of all, we don't know what we want and the kind of thing that we have very, at least some vague idea of like uh, what we want or what we can do, or those are like a much, much inferior than the kind of things that we cannot even consciously imagine right now, but also at the within reach, let's say within the next hundred years. So I, I, I find it very tricky, uh, of course, to sell this kind of point of view to like uh, politicians or like uh, administration people that actually make important decisions. But this is, this is what I honestly think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for your uh, honest opinions. Um, just uh, my last question and then we can ask uh, the, our audience to ask uh, uh, questions. Um, any uh, current project or future project that you are working on? Can you share? <laughs> We'd like to see insight of what you are doing these days or in the near future. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't have one and I wish I could do something surprising, not, not to other people, but 
to myself. So I, I want, really want to, it's, mm -hmm. that's always been my wish. I want to do something that's surprising to myself. Great, great. So uh, let's move now to uh, our audience. <coughs> Let me see. Okay, let me, let me quickly go through. Do you see all the questions? Uh, I don't see any questions. Oh, I except... think people just sent to me. Um, no, you, okay, so you can, <laughs> you can ask your question. I have my colleague here, so what's your question? Go ahead. Hi. Um... I have a one question uh, about uh, your relationship to language. Um, maybe my question is uh, one scholarly one because I'm a literature major yes. and uh, also I have a personal question. So my um, kind of academic question is, uh, what if I presuppose that your poetic involvement in your younger days might have affected the ways in which you have begun to engage with uh, mathematical or other uh, languages uh, in your professional career, then how would you comment on that? I think it may be different from like uh, the just uh, poetry versus uh, mathematics. I feel that you're the, the way that uh, you use language with precision and nuance seems to be very um, special. And uh, I wonder how your relationship to language in general, or even like Korean language might have um, influenced the ways in which you grasp this unknowable uh, kind of world. And my personal question is that, I know that one of the poets that you were interested in when you're young, uh, remote uh, from now, but um, it was Ki Hyung-do. And I would like to know what about him or what about his poetry uh, let you sustain your interest when you're interested in his poetry? Well, uh, those were two questions that I will try to remember very hard, but let me start by answering the first one. So again, like I don't know whether my interest in poetry or anything has some effect on my mathematics, but it is true that I have been always a very language oriented person. So there are many different types of mathematicians and in a sense, every mathematician operates in a completely different way, but there are like a few rough species of us. Like some of us are very, very geometric in the sense that they visualize everything and they are very, very good at it. Even like high dimensional spaces and how things move inside that and so on. And some other of us are like a very good with numbers and computations. And I am certainly neither of those guys. I'm terrible with geometry. I'm terrible with numbers and not terrible like uh, computations and so on. But I am very sensitive to language. And I think it has been one of my strong points as a research mathematician. Like uh, I, I think all the mathematics completely like uh, linguistically, like in, in language. This is not true to every mathematician. I think some people almost not use any language in when forming their initial insight, at least. Eventually, they were going to write their papers in language, but at least at the, when the ideas are forming. But I, I operate from beginning to the end completely in language. And, uh, and it is a very useful thing because uh, mathematics, uh, above all, is a kind of communication. And of course, being able to communicate your ideas precisely to other people, that's important. But even before that, 
it's a kind of internal dialogue of you and yourself. You had uh, some vague feeling about certain thing and you want to make it precise. And how do you do that? One way of doing that is to have a very long extended conversation with yourself. That's, that's what I do. And our minds have uh, this amazing ability that produces something out of nothing, right? Initially, you have no idea what's inside you, but as you continue your conversation with yourself, you come up with things that like your former, like a past self had like absolutely could have not dreamed of without any external data. And, and the, for this process, at least for me, the ability to handle language is in a very precise and fluent way that's, uh, that's been important for me. And I think also the, my, my background uh, being raised as a Korean in a completely Korean language. And then now I'm living and working in an English setting. Uh, having these uh, two different types of languages has been enormously useful to me because it's almost like uh, having a dual operating system. You, you can get stuck in a Korean mode and, and then you, you switch to English. So you start thinking in English and then that's a completely different person and you have a very fresh start on the problem that you have been stuck before. And if this guy gets stuck and you can switch to your Korean thing and then you can start thinking in Korean mode and that, that guy is a completely new person that has nothing to do with the former person that got stuck. So you have again a fresh start and you can go back and forth and having this dual operating system. Like I, I suppose this is the same for many of you who are in the Zoom room right now. So I think this is a, this is a good thing. Okay, I have a many questions just coming to me and I'm trying to cut and paste it, giving to everyone. And, and I don't know how many I captured. Uh, Professor, I, I completely forgot about the second question, which uh, oh. now I recall. Right, there was there were two questions. <laughs> well, Sherry we move to because yeah. there are so many other right. questions. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, so uh, maybe uh, maybe one question at a time. Yeah. Maybe. So so, so uh, uh, Professor Ho, I put. Uh, could you go to chat box and see there are a bunch of yes. questions that yes. I just cut and paste uh, came yes. to me. So I shared with you, and yes. if you could uh, look at them and and answer, you know, a few of those questions. Oh, I choose. Yeah, you have a freedom to choose. So you see a number of questions coming in the chat box. Is that correct? Yes, I I can I can see them now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you could. Uh, you know, there is a one one written in Korean that ask about the depression, how to deal with the depression. As okay, a you can answer that question if you like. Yeah, I mean, I can at least say that I have the same kind of problem. That's uh, my biggest thing to handle, at least in my life. I mean, my my life has been generally good. I didn't have like a serious like a difficulties in health or like economic issues or that sort of thing and in that sense i have been extremely lucky and fortunate to be surrounded by good people within a good environment but uh, the one thing that i had to take care of was this uh, depression thing and i i don't know i don't know a good solution to that but just uh i think it's a surprisingly common thing in academia and society in general. Um, um, just uh, I think it's generally helpful just to keep just keep that in mind as you are perhaps not special, but in a good way. It's a very common problem. And then the yeah, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say too much, but uh, good luck. 
Okay, there uh, are other questions in the chat box. Um, the simple one simple question is actually they asked you to repeat the book you you mentioned earlier. Oh, the title is Consolations by David White. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not very good at choosing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to pick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe you should. Okay, pick. maybe one math question. Uh, yeah. uh, Do you think that infinity could physically exist in our world? Oh, I, I that's not a math question. That's a physics <laughs> question. Is that right? Philosophy. Yeah. Philosophy. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there is a physicist in the room, so I, should, I will refrain <laughs> from speaking yeah okay so what should i choose what type of music do you listen to oh um i i like a lot of different types of music i i like classical music jazz music uh, i i well i had a blues period where i listened to all sorts of blues um you know about 20 years ago, I, I was really into Eric Clapton. Um, mm -hmm. And no, uh, I had my jazz period. Uh, classically, I, I, I'm pretty much into Bach. Uh, I really admire his work. And then there was a question that uh, for you know, students after college and graduate school to, to uh, continue uh, STEM, their careers in STEM, uh, do you think there should be a societal or institutional institutional uh, support or any, any specific uh, support uh, needed for them to remain? Um, well, I mean, if you really want to work in the STEM field and that's, that's your thing, and then of course it would be a very good thing to have a systematic support, maybe at the institutional level or even like in a bigger level that helps you do that. But at the same time, like, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's good for society. I don't have a, like a insight on the large things, but uh, at the like individual level, if a friend was asking me, um, then uh, I, I would say that, yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe that was not the point of the question, but uh, maybe it's not a very good thing that you frame yourself to be like, I, I need to be in the STEM field. Like, uh, there, there are so many different things one can do out in the world. And uh, I have seen like, uh, pure math PhDs, uh, maybe pure phys theoretical physics PhDs, like uh, going into industries and then doing wonderful stuff, having a happy and meaningful life. Uh, and somehow some of us, when we are young, uh, uh, consider those possibilities as sort of uh, insulting, right? It, that's, I think that's very specific to academia, maybe uh, some sort of uh, artist maybe, but... Uh, but I, I, I think that's not very healthy. Um, so be, uh, I think being open-minded is uh, generally a good thing. Good, I think um, since we have uh, two minutes left, uh, sorry everyone that we cannot <laughs> go through all the questions, but there are a lot of questions about already, I think you, the professor had touched a little bit here and there. So. Uh, um, it was a fascinating conversation and very inspiring. Uh, so uh, I'd like to thank you again. Uh, I know that everyone uh, won't be able to give a big round of applause. I think we can. Uh, let me see. Uh, Joseph, could you make everybody? Oh, please don't. I. 
I just uh, don't like being okay. Okay, but, but you can just imagine that you'll get a big round of applause. And uh, thank you again. And uh, uh, again, as I said, that it will be very, very helpful, valuable to uh, all of us uh, this evening. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And have a wonderful evening. I look forward to seeing all of you again at future KCA events. Thank you, Yanggi. Yeah, uh, thanks for everyone for coming and uh, spending an hour with me. Um, I don't think I have uh, <laughs> uh, delivered the great wisdom to you guys, uh, but at least you will find value uh, in, in seeing uh, that. Absolutely, yeah. very, very valuable. I think you were okay. very <laughs> honest. Uh, the the opinions and what you're thinking. I think it's just a seeing that is a, such a valuable uh, evening for us. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, and thanks for your time. And maybe thank you. Yeah, or pass bye -bye. at some point. Bye. Okay. Bye bye.